Okay, so shall we start? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today for a webinar on opportunities for the UK companies uh, in the services sectors uh, in Russia. We have a wonderful panel of speakers today, and you will hear today from uh, the director for DIT in Russia, Travel News, and the experts from PwC who have provided a very extensive study and research, and will share with you the findings of this research, and hopefully we will encourage you to consider Russia as a the next market of your choice. So uh, during the sessions, uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat option to ask us the questions we should consider in the end of the presentations. So let's begin and over to Trevor now. Okay, Sebastian, thank you very much. I'll just uh, try and bring up those slides. Excellent, just double checking, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you very much indeed to PwC colleagues who are going to run through uh, this presentation in more detail. I'm just going to sort of do a few minutes of, of, of basic introductory remarks and, and some comments and a little bit on the background to this. Uh, and the background is that actually we became aware um, some while ago looking at our statistics that the UK share of the Russian services market was 3.8% whereas in the global share is about 7.8%. So there's a gap of 4% in Russia, and we couldn't quite work out why that was or exactly where it was. So that's when we reached out to the experts in PwC to do this research for us. So, so that's the basic background. There's a gap. We identified the gap, but we didn't know exactly where it was, and we wanted to find out what that gap is, exactly where it is, so that we can you know, do our best to exploit it. So, so that's the basic background in terms of uh, the, the sort of work that we've been doing on this. Just in terms of uh, some more general background, particularly for those less familiar with Russia, just to be very clear that the British government does support sanctions compliant trade with Russia. Uh, I think there's lots of myths about doing business in Russia, and we think that this puts off a lot of SMEs in particular. They see the bad news on the, on, on the TV, uh, films, movies, whatever it may be, you know, uh, often which don't present Russia in a great light. And I think for some companies that just puts them off, they just think it's all too difficult. Whereas our experience actually, and the experience of of a lot of British companies operating here is that Russia is a good market for them. Uh, they do well here and they enjoy doing business here. Uh, so we're also quite keen just to encourage more people to come uh, and look at it, and particular SMEs where we think you know, they will do particularly well here. I'll just move on to the next slide. Yeah, and there's just some, some basic key facts here, which I think to a certain extent uh, speak to themselves. Um, but uh, I think it is important just to recognize that it is a very large economy, Russia. Obviously, a lot of it uh, natural resources based, but it is a large economy. Uh, and I think particularly for this seminar, when we start looking down at the services uh, uh, sort of imports at uh, 74 billion pounds a year already, 20% uh, of which come from overseas. And then if you look at the forecast of potential of six to seven percent growth, you're looking at an extra five billion pounds worth of business over the next you know, four to five years, which we would like British companies to, to benefit from. So uh, there is that potential for growth uh, of what's already quite a big market. I think it's worth you know, emphasizing there that uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in Russia about localization, and I'm sure there will be some trends in that direction. But that's a very, very big gap, 20 percent, that you, know, you won't be able to make up just through domestic expertise. Uh, it will improve over time. I'm sure it will grow over time. But I think I think as that grows, there's also considerable opportunities for British companies to get involved and share their knowledge and their expertise to help those Russian companies that want to uh, localize and bring more of the skills in in house. Just sort of some basic trade statistics there. The, the one fact I'm always particularly keen to emphasize is that Russia is a large market for the UK. These these are the figures for 2020. The figures for actual 2019 were considerably larger. The 2020 figures like they would be for pretty much every market around the world are much reduced because of COVID and obviously the flows of trade and the flows of goods and services. So, so it was normally or typically a market of about six billion pounds. Uh, so it did shrink a bit last year, but I say almost entirely down to COVID. So we hope now as we emerge from COVID that those figures will start to go, go up again. And even when it was a six billion pounds, the split, as you can see in the sort of graph at the very bottom there, the pie chart, was still roughly 50-50. So throughout the, the time I've been here, which is, which is only two years, but going back a few years before that, it's always been roughly 50-50 between goods and services. So the services part of our export market to Russia is quite considerable and one that we're, again, very keen to exploit even further and build even more. 
I should have said one of the, one of the things that I wanted to just say about those figures there before before I'd moved on was that Russia, as I say, is a big market for us, is a good market. The, the ones I always compare it to are South Africa, Brazil, and Mexico. So our exports uh, to Russia are considerably larger than they are to each of those markets. And, and the reason I stress that is because I know when I'm back in London, particularly in DIT headquarters, you hear lots of noise about Brazil and South Africa and Mexico and these must be the markets British companies should go to and yet our existing market in Russia despite all the problems is considerably larger than those and then this slide just sort of breaks down a little bit more uh, into the individual services sector uh, where, where the, busy, the biggest market share for us is at the moment and I think uh, as I understand it right other business services uh, a large chunk of that will be consultancy which doesn't come as a great surprise because you know all the uh, major consultancy British companies are based here as well they've got quite a good presence here so that's obviously a very good market for them but going through down to financial transportation telecoms insurance and pensions but all ones that we think uh, could grow uh, go quite considerably more uh, and legal services again is another sector which is, is, is very good for us and we do quite a lot of work on that around uh, themes like English Law Week uh, and uh, Russian Law Week when it goes to the UK so again uh, certainly a, a market that's good for us in theirs and then just a little bit more specifically looking at, at, at technology and, and, and the reason we flagged this one up is because that's where a lot of growth is, is to be seen I think over the next few years I mentioned that IMF uh, estimate of sort of six to seven percent growth uh, and part of that uh, growth Growth certainly will be around ICT and data. Uh, there's there's some um, sort of cynicism around uh, Russia's national projects. This is a big uh, a big sort of scheme uh, in sort of you know a number of sectors where Russia wants to develop. And I think part of this is in response to the fact that I think people are waking up to the fact that you can't be a natural resources giant forever. And particularly with clean energy, green energy coming through the system, uh, there would be uh, lots of parts of the Russian economy which over the next 10, 15 years and beyond will probably start to, to slow down a bit. So the Russian government's woken up to that and is now focusing on particular sectors that it wants to develop to maintain the economy and this is not unique to Russia I think anyone who's familiar with Saudi Arabia will see a, a similar pattern there they've got this sort of you know 2030 target for them to start diversifying their economy so I think Russia slightly be behind that but it is certainly moving in that direction and the national projects is seen as one way of doing that to diversify but continue to keep it a healthy economy but as natural resources begin to dwindle uh, we need to see new sectors growing and technology is one that definitely will uh, will grow quite rapidly and, and, and you'll see the, the various points there about double digit growth. Fintech again is, is one where we do see you know, quite a lot of growth here and uh, Russia uh, for those of you less familiar with it is, is a very very innovative market uh, you know things that you can do here which you know I've been hugely impressed with with its taxi services or your online banking all these things I mean it's not all you need to Russia but I think Russia again for people who are not familiar with it is, is, is very far ahead of where people might imagine it to be if you're not familiar with how things work, work here and then other things there so 76% internet penetration and 160% mobile penetration which I assume means people who've got more than one mobile phone and you'll quite often see people here in restaurants sat at a, a table with two or three phones uh, and uh, I'm not sure how good the social conversation is because whenever you look over most of them seem to be looking more at their phone than they are at, it, at each other but mobile phones and that way of life is, is very much prevalent in Russia as is in many places uh, and again you know a lot of that in the big cities so if you're looking at uh, obviously Moscow, St. Petersburg but then other big big cities all around the country you can go all the way over to the far east into Vladivostok and down to Nizhny Novgorod, Rostov, uh, Kazan, big big cities so uh, a lot of those are very dependent on, on the infrastructure and a lot of those cities uh, which have got developing their own sort of city plans are also very very keen to diversify their economies and, and modernize them as well and ICT will be certainly one way that that's done and then so yeah compliance within the financial uh, within, in, within the financial services uh, sector is also seen as a huge area for growth and we know that will be of, of, of interest to the UK uh, UK companies uh, and then again governance risk and compliance we've been doing quite a lot of work with the, with the city UK and uh, Moscow International Financial Centre around DSG and a lot of that has been around corporate governance and how you develop that uh, so what we would hope would come from that work is that some of the ideas that are adopted would be as we would see them you know UK best practice and we would hope on that basis that would open some doors for, for British companies as well 
Uh, and then just the sort of, you know, some of the strong domestic players, so Yandex, uh, Sphere, Tinkoff, Yandex, I think certainly are looking to, to internationalize a bit as well. So some of these Russian companies, which aren't so well known outside of this region yet, I think probably will be uh, in years to come. So uh, getting alongside some of those might not just be good for uh, developing a market in Russia, but might be able to take people with the right skills beyond that. Uh, now I'm pretty sure if I click on now that that's uh, the last of my slides, in which case I'm very happy to, to hand over to David, I think is, is taking on from PwC. Uh, and thank you again to PwC for all your support with this. And again, thank you everyone who's joined us today. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Can I just check, can, can people hear me and see me? Is that okay? Yeah. Great. Listen, Trevor, thanks a million for that uh, background. And uh, thanks everybody for inviting us here today. Just by way of sort of personal introduction, and I'll ask my colleague from PwC Russia, Oksana, to do the same in a, in a minute. But just let me introduce myself so you, you know who's talking and where I'm coming from. I'll get Oksana to do the same, and then if it's okay, we'll get into. We have a sort of short deck of slides that tries to summarize the results of the research that, 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 that we did that Trevor alluded to there. But look, just by way of introduction, so I'm David Armstrong. I'm a partner in PwC in the UK. Uh, I lead, in, in our world, I lead a, a, what we call our international, our international development team in PwC UK. And basically that is, uh, means that I'm responsible for all the work we do for the likes of the Department for International Trade and for the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and some other bodies, basically the, the bits of the UK government that have an outward orientation. You know, so I would, I would over the years have done a lot of work for DIT. I spent a big part of this year working alongside Trevor's colleagues in the headquarters in DIT on the exports and inward investment strategy for the UK. And I've done a lot of uh, sort of global work with the FCDO, supporting FCDO in terms of running a series of, of global development programs. And I'll say a little bit more about some of those uh, later. By way of personal background, I'm an economist. So about a thousand years ago, I did a PhD in economics at Warwick University in the English Midlands and enjoyed that very much. And uh, for a time in PwC, five or six years ago, I led the PwC economics team in the UK, you know, and it was indeed people from, from that team and our counterparts in PwC Moscow who did the research. So that's a little bit of background from me, but thanks Trevor and Ludmilla for the kind introduction to come and talk today. And before we get into the slides, Oksana, would you mind just telling everybody a little bit of background about yourself, please? Thanks. Yes, sure, no problem. Thank you, David. Um, as said, my name is Oksana Kulakova. I work for PwC Russia Moscow office for the uh, team, which is called um, Government and Public Services. So we basically work a lot with both local governments and uh, internationally in case it is uh, required, in case there is a uh, client uh, opportunity uh, to do so. And uh, personally, I am uh, through like last, I think, three years, I'm working a lot with export oriented projects, both for Russian companies, so uh, building kind of export acceleration, uh, building export strategies for uh, Russian, both SMEs and large companies. And um, in case of the request of uh, international teams, international companies willing to export to Russia, we also support those. Uh, by way of personal background a bit, I have uh, graduated from a local university of international relations, so I'm an international economist by background. Then I graduated from LSC, uh, not a million years ago, but some, well, I think 10 years ago from a master's program and then last year I, I got an MBA from Vienna so also I have quite a uh, quite an extensive international experience both in studies and in um, work projects so in case you have any other uh, requests uh, for a Russian team of PwC please don't hesitate to reach out so here David over to you okay. to start with the Thanks. Thanks, Oksana, for that. Uh, do, and can I check, do I click, to get the slides up, do I click on the slides or does somebody do that for me? Apologies for asking. Okay, thanks a million. And I can probably flick them on myself. So, 
Look, that's that's great. Uh, Trevor Trevor said in his introduction, he used the word myths in his introduction. You know that there's some myths abroad amongst UK businesses about what Russia is like and the geopolitics and the media and that sort of thing. And and I'm probably Trevor guilty of before we got into this research believing in some of those myths because you know to be completely honest with you before we went on this journey with DIT and did this research project I probably had some of those in my head I mean Russia was never really a place that I had considered much or thought about much I mean I, I went once and had a brilliant time at a conference when I was a young academic in Moscow and absolutely loved it and that's it you know and you know I sort of probably believed some of the hype and I just sort of tended to focus on other places like Trevor as you say South Africa or the US or whatever and I suppose the journey we've gone on with this research is we've had a pretty sort of serious look at the at the data about trade uh, between and particularly exporting services to Russia and I suppose that's shifted my mindset a little and we'll maybe come back to that sort of wider theme in, in, in a minute but look just to sort of tee up the the presentation and after this slide I'll hand over to Oksana and then I'll come back in towards the end with a few slides on what people have told us about some of the barriers they perceive. But just in terms of teeing this up, uh, the objectives of the, the research were, I mean, these were the exam questions on the left-hand side that the DIT set us as a team. And I suppose, you know, I would focus on three things in those questions. Firstly, priorities. You know, so which service sectors have the highest potential? We can't do everything, we can't focus. So where should government focus and where should business focus? The second is barriers. You know, what's stopping us? Is it the myths? Is it regulation? Is it finance? Is it relationships? So what are the barriers? And thirdly, and the last bullet on the left-hand side there, you know, what could we do to overcome this? So those were the exam questions, if you like. And in order to tackle those questions, we stepped through a sort of pretty traditional economic research methodology, I guess. And we'll not do justice to it today. We'll only be able to sort of skim over some of the sort of high level findings. But suffice it to say that our economists did a pretty heavy duty piece of statistical quantitative economic analysis that looked at the trends and the flows and the indices and all of that sort of modeling work that tried then to identify what the opportunities were and what we should focus on. So it was fundamentally a pretty hardcore uh, economic study that we did, but we supplemented that. We weren't just away in the sort of back room, you know, doing the number crunching. We tried to bring relevant stories and insights to sort of cross-reference against the data through talking to people who were in business and had an experience of working in some of the priority sectors that we identified and had a view on some of these issues. So it was it's fundamentally a quantitative study, study, but supplemented with some qualitative research. So that's all. Oksana, would you like to take us through just the next few slides on some of the quantitative findings, please? Oksana, over to you. Yes, thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, I would like maybe to start with uh, a short uh, introduction to uh, Russian consumption of services, which in uh, by the way, it's very important to understand that this study uh, was undertaken in January 2020. So uh, it basically uh, describes numbers of 2018 and in some cases 19, but unfortunately we were kind of unable to uh, involve and cover the COVID effects, which there are, of course. 
but I think that the recovery is on its way, so we can speak that the numbers are flattening out a bit. So in 2018, uh, Russian consumption of services was uh, equivalent to almost 30% of uh, GDP of the country, and the remainder of domestic consumption was attributed to goods, including oil and gas, manufacturing, and fuel and added energy industries, as you would expect. However, uh, the dynamics of services is uh, pretty good, and the construction services uh, were uh, the largest chunk. Uh, that sector captured almost um, a fifth of domestic consumption of services. And combined, uh, the financial, telecommunication, R&D, and engineering services uh, totaled uh, kind of, if I'm not mistaken, um, almost 90, uh, 90 billion uh, pounds. So this demonstrates that Russian consumption uh, is uh, also focusing on the types of services which are complementary with uh, UK capabilities. So if, uh, back to this particular slide, uh, you can see here that uh, the crisis uh, kind of caused the uh, caused by the collapse of oil prices and the situation around the Ukraine in 2014 um, caused the GDP of Russia uh, to drop a bit. So it has been comparatively low. And additional drop, of course, was co caused by COVID pandemics, as I already mentioned. However, uh, officially, the central bank, uh, bank predicts that the um, recovery is on its way, and uh, the GDP is expected to grow by around three and three and a half percent in a couple of years from now. Um, uh, so the US and the UK exports uh, suffered uh, a lot since the crash, and both countries are uh, currently well, two years ago, basically one and a half years ago, uh, exporting. Um, uh, like 30 or 40 percent less than in 2014 and you can see here the top uh, six countries uh, Russia imports from and the imports volumes of services are returning back to pre-crisis levels um, all countries aside from Ireland and France uh, have found it kind of difficult to enter the Russian services market since the crisis and it's important to understand that Ireland and France are both heavily uh, dependent on a small number of sectors. For example, for the Irish experts, it has been operational leasing that has been the backbone for its exports volumes to Russia. And uh, for France, uh, it's uh, largely architectural engineering and other technical uh, attributed to construction uh, services and their share was uh, almost 50 percent of all the country's exports to uh, russia under this um, category so yeah i can control the slides it's good so if we have a brief uh, look uh, at the uh, uk um, exports to russia it has a wider sectoral spread uh, as we would say than uh, ireland and france and there is a strong UK competitiveness in uh, legal reinsurance and audiovisual services. Uh, UK is currently holding a small share of the financial and telecommunication services sectors. And um, although it is uh, regarded in the world uh, very well for its capability in finance and telecommunication, uh, there is a um, well. The percentage of imports in Russia uh, of those services is not so large. Um, this also is aligned with uh, our results from interviews. Uh, the interviewees suggested that uh, this might be the case because many Russian uh, state-owned entities are uh, backed by uh, public finance at large. Uh, so dynamically, um, imports from the UK have uh, declined um, within between uh, 2008 and 2018, and um, reinsurance and audiovisuals have helped the recovery of the uh, import uh, volumes. And these experts have added a lot to the uh, UK export recovery in the Russian market. So the next slide is um, might be a bit difficult. I will try to explain how we uh, actually uh, identified four priority sectors uh, with the highest potential from our side uh, for growth 
in imports uh, to Russia. So you can see that uh, we used uh, five indicators, RCA index, GAP, uh, trade intensity index, propensity to import, and UK imports to total Russian consumption. Uh, in short, the first one, uh, reveal comparative advantage. Um, it helps to assess the UK's export potential in service type uh, in this particular type of service exports. The second one is the gap. Um, um, it's it helps to analyze the UK performance uh, in Russia only. So it measured, um, it's measured against weighted average volume of UK exports of each service category. The third one, uh, trade intensity index, um, is used to determine whether the value of trade between the two countries is greater or smaller than it would be expected on the basis of their uh, relative importance in the, uh, so to say, in world trade. And fourth one is propensity to inputs, which is basically the percentage of consumption locally covered by inputs. It's suggested, uh, it suggests uh, whether the uh, consumption is rush in Russia is uh, prone to uh, importing this particular um, type of service. And the last one is the probably the easiest one, uh, the UK inputs to total Russian consumption. So the share of Russian consumption of the given service uh, covered by UK inputs. And looking at those, uh, also having um, had a number of interviews and uh, also in discussions with our colleagues from DIT, uh, we identified four priority sectors to focus on. So uh, those are advertising market research. Uh, we can see that there is a high propensity for Russian consumers to input uh, marketing services, not only from the UK, but in general. And British imports are, uh, have a very strong position there uh, because uh, British imports already cover 20% of Russian total imports of those services. And um, it's also uh, necessary to mention that bilateral trade is lower than we would expect given global benchmarks. So the low, tr low trade intensity index uh, suggests that. Uh, number two, legal and business services. Uh, there's a high propensity to input services from this sector. Uh, however, well, due to uh, political and um, uh, political basically landscape, uh, many international law firms have reduced their presence in Russia. Some have uh, left the market. However, the potential is strong, and the UK has a strong comparative advantage in the sector, and also a historical basis uh, to build uh, on further this market in Russia. Uh, financial services. Um, so here the gap indicators suggest that the import of UK financial services is significantly lower than uh, the level we would expect, uh, judging by comparable countries. And the UK has a strong uh, comparative uh, RCA index, a real comparative advantage in the sector. Uh, Currently, these services are the UK's number one export category worldwide. And last but not least, ICT. Uh, so here we combine computer information services and telecommunication services. Uh, the UK has a good offering in global market. Uh, low trade intensity index kind of suggests that there is further room for growth. And uh, the UK, again, here is starting from a position of uh, quite um, a good, um, already having uh, a good uh, share in the markets with uh, the UK imports making up for 10% of total Russian imports of this sector. So uh, here's the overview how we uh, analytically um, uh, kind of came to those four industries we would like uh, to uh, stress policy actions further on. So, David, I think uh, this is all sure. for me. Thank you, Oksana. That's excellent. Thank you for taking us through the quantitative analysis at a high level. And uh, as you said, Oksana, at the beginning, I, I forgot to say in my introduction that, yes, we, we did the research. Uh, you know, I, I was looking back there. I think we submitted our final report last summer to DIT, which was obviously at a particular point in relation to the COVID cycle. So I, I hope everybody on the call forgives us, if you like, if some of the numbers that we have used are a little bit uh, out of date and that sort of thing. But but our hope is that what with the kernel, if you like, of what we've arrived at in the research 
still stands, we think. And, and our hope is that, you know, we've got enough here to certainly kick off or continue some of the sort of conversations that we would we would all like to see in order to try and stimulate activity between the, the two countries. So so thanks, Oksana. I mean, really all I wanted to do now, as Oksana said, we, we've arrived at the four different priority sectors. And I've basically got one slide on each here, plus at the very end, a summary slide with some recommendations. And if it's okay with you, I'd just like to to canter through some of the key findings that we, we came to in relation to what people in business were saying to us about the barriers to doing business in these particular sectors. And the first is uh, on market research services and advertising. As Oksana said, like there's a really solid platform here from the UK. Uh, you know, and actually Russia has a really good track record of importing services in relation to market research and advertising. And when we looked at the data of everything that Russia imported at the time in this sector, it was something like one fifth, as Oksana says, was from the UK. So, so like a really good starting point for this. And when we looked at the barriers, there were a number of things on this slide. I mean, I would summarize it with Firstly, insight. Secondly, talent. And thirdly, finance. Now, on insight, what we're trying to get across there is that what we've picked up from people in business and from colleagues in DIT and elsewhere is that uh, relationships really matter in this sort of sector. I used to work in it myself, and I know the score that, you know, there's a lot on the gossip in this sector, you know, who's talking to whom and what's coming out when and who you know and, you know, what you know about the pipeline and all. And actually, even in my, when I think of when I was doing this sort of work in PwC, you know, just in the UK now, like we had a bit of a maxim that if a tender from a client dropped on your desk and you didn't know it was going to drop and that it was going to drop then, you should nearly always not bid for it because the fact that you didn't know about it signaled that you probably weren't well connected enough with the people who were buying it and the stakeholders who were in and around it. And in relation to market research and exporting this sort of stuff from the UK, that was writ large over a lot of the feedback that we got, that sort of local market insight and relationships. Secondly, on talent, I mean, there was no shortage, I have to say, of technical skills in relation to data science, IT, research, and other aspects of sort of uh, technical talent. But the interesting thing that we got was there, there was a bit of an issue around uh, getting the people who had those sort of technical skills and the ability to combine them with managerial and leadership skills. And again, I that resonated with me. I've, I've done plenty of interviews for, certainly for market research positions over the years in the UK. And some of the, the best people technically who had PhDs coming out their ears and, you know, who had all the qualifications you could ask for, they didn't make it through because I knew they would struggle with what the interpersonals were in the room and how to get on with people and how to manage teams of people and how to lean into leadership positions. And I think we've picked up that that sort of combination of technical and managerial stroke leadership was a bit of an issue in this sector. And thirdly, on finance, and it's partly because this sector, I mean, I used to be involved quite a lot with the UK's Market Research Society, which is the sort of the industry body for this sector. And I, I remember doing a, you know, a piece of work for the MRS, or we, we called it the business of evidence. And it was all about the size of the market and, and the, the profile, if you like, of the market research industry in the UK. And I mean, it was a good few years ago, but certainly back then it was clear that, that the sector is dominated by a lot of small and medium sized enterprises and the, the sort of culture abroad in the sector is very much an SME one. And, you know, the people we spoke to 
definitely highlighted some of the constraints that SMEs have in relation to accessing finance in Russia that would enable them to grow and expand uh, operations. So inside talent and finance were three of the, the key barriers in that sector. And then just conscious of time, so moving, uh, moving quickly on to the uh, second of our sectors. Uh, and I just have some notes that I've lost. Yeah, the second of our sectors was legal and business services. Forgive me for that. It was really interesting here because the starting point was similar in that, you know, the UK has a strong platform in relation to legal and business services. It's not quite the same as market research, but it's nearly a fifth of all Russian imports in legal and business services or are from the UK, but the barriers felt a bit different. And it felt like the barriers were a bunch of maybe harder or more structural issues that were, that were sort of discouraging people from getting into exporting in the sector. And I mean, I've got, I've got some of the points on the slide, but just to highlight three things again, Firstly, qualifications, secondly, recruitment, and thirdly, payment terms. I mean, the qualifications, again, there's no shortage of sort of legal talent in Russia, but, you know, in order to practice, you know, non-nationals have to, you know, at practical level undertake examinations and have a certain number of years of local practice. So there's just the pr a bunch of practical issues in relation to the validity and transferability of legal qualifications that was putting some people off, I guess. Secondly, on employment, as I say, no shortage of high quality law graduates, but there was certainly a perception that the costs, certainly to SMEs of getting people in and where necessary, getting people out, that whole sort of recruitment process in this sector just felt a little clunkier than people would have liked it to feel. And as such, that sort of labor market rigidity was certainly a perceived barrier for some of the businesses who were considering Russia as a market. And thirdly, payment terms. I mean, in my sort of PwC world at the moment, June is, the end of our financial year in PwC. So, so I have, as we speak, lots of very enthusiastic finance people chasing me at the moment uh, in a very polite English way, I have to say, but chasing me to, to get invoices out to clients and, and to get cash in from clients, you know. And, and so I know the deal you know, as somebody, you know, certainly in the PwC business land and like our payment terms in PwC are 30 days or, or thereabouts. And I have to say that Trevor and his colleagues in the UK government are generally pretty good at honouring those sort of uh, payment terms. But we got quite a lot within this sector of like it going beyond like 120 days. And if I have anything in my ledger on that, it goes in their red box and I get all sorts of, you know, senior people breathing down my neck on it. So, so that is an issue that raises issues about, you know, uh, managing your work in progress and accumulating interest payments and all, which are just unhelpful. And from a business point of view can put people off. So so this sector was interesting, similar sort of starting point, but a, a sort of different bunch of barriers, it's, it seemed. On financial services, again, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time this last 12 months with, with colleagues of, of Trevor's and Ludmilla's in, in DIT headquarters in London. And I remember there's a particularly intense time through the summer and the early autumn just past where we uh, spent a lot of time working with DIT on a strategy, sort of piece of strategy work, trying to help with the sort of strategy for exports uh, for the UK and for the Inward Investment Strategy for the UK. And that was a really sort of intensive, sort of existential piece of work. And it, it sort of 
pulls you into existential questions, I guess, about, you know, post-Brexit and post-COVID. Who are we in the UK and what do we stand for and what do other people think of us? And, and down from that, like, what are we actually good at? And what sectors have we a genuine global reputation in? And where, wherever you're having that sort of conversation about the UK's assets, I guess, you inevitably come very quickly to financial services being up towards the top of that list, partly but not exclusively related to the, the global role of the City of London. And, and that, in some of the quantitative analysis that uh, Oksana talked us through, that comes through really strongly about the UK's sort of leading position. But the flip side of that is that we really haven't, uh, you know, the, the sort of export of financial services, insurance and reinsurance, is just not where we would like it to be, I guess for a bunch of very good reasons, I have to say. So it's not that people don't have the appetite, but the sort of barriers that we were coming up with here in relation to market entry, sanctions and market maturity, were all very real for people, I have to say. So for example, you know, five big insurance companies locally are generating over half of the total uh, insurance premium every year and you had the role of the Russian national reinsurance company and there was also something around you know a general lack of trust in relation to private sector insurance so so this like it may have moved on since we did, did the research I'm not sure but like this was very real at the time and you know we we were sort of very respectful of this sort of feedback that was coming back from businesses however I mean, there were signs of hope, I guess, which was, you know, coupled with the strong platform that the, the UK has in this area, which is why it's on this list of priority sectors. And as Trevor alluded to, I think maybe Trevor, you mentioned either the Alpha Bank or the Tinkoff uh, organization at the, at the beginning. You know, there are some good examples of successful private commercial banks in Russia, you know, and, and there's a good opportunity and therefore that sort of paves a way for a good opportunity for UK to start to lean in a bit more to this sector. And the final sector, before I jump on to some sort of high level conclusions, was, as Oksana said, ICT technology and the like. I mean, the story here about barriers, I mean, I would highlight two things on this. Firstly, business partnerships. I mean, if I think even of the way in which Oksana and her team and the PwC UK team tackled this piece of research for DIT, I mean, we're sort of lucky enough to be pretty joined up globally as an organization when the opportunity came in and we looked at it to qualify it we reached out immediately to uh oksana and our colleagues in in russia it's we're we'll work off the same sort of platforms emails mobile systems it's all sort of easy enough you know and as long as everybody approaches it in a sort of respectful way it's it works quite nicely as an and to be honest with you we couldn't have done the work properly without that sort of collaboration between, and that sort of business partnership between PwC in the UK and PwC uh, Russia. And if I think then I mentioned the FCDO uh, is a big client of mine and has been for many years. I think of one of the things I'm doing, I, I lead a big education program for the FCDO that's been up and running for 10 years. It's a sort of what I would call an international development program focused on primary education in developing countries. We're probably active in 15 or 20 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia currently. We simply could not deliver that without proper business partnerships. And I suppose, firstly, between me and my colleagues and counterparts in other sort of PwC countries, but also to deliver that sort of work, some of which is pretty specialist, we need to develop like long-term partnership arrangements with individuals, SMEs, and other companies who are involved in delivering that particular aspect of education. So, so I get it. 
And in the sort of ICT technology land, that idea of developing partnerships was was writ large over the feedback that we got from businesses and through other sources about one of the mechanisms through which UK companies could start uh, exporting uh, to Russia. And I suppose then linked to that, there was definitely something around the sort of local labor market dynamics and procurement regulations. And again, like we did this a while ago, but this this idea of the three as a crowd rule where, you know, if, if at least two local bids are are received, then other bids can be disregarded, including those from, you know, there was things like that. Of, you know, I'm not sure, I wouldn't over-focus on that particular one, but just some of those sort of local dynamics in the labor market for ICT and technology and telecommunications just felt to be going against some of the UK companies as they were considering the, the opportunities in Russia. And then look, you know, in conclusion, uh, one of the things, you know, that the DIT asked us to consider was, well, look, yeah, tell us, give us a bit on the situation, give us a bit on the barriers, and tell us something about, you know, what we can do to address the barriers. And, I mean, these recommendations, I mean, we're all in this together in a sense, and we all have to take our own sort of responsibility for doing what we can do. But I suppose, you know, our recommendations to Trevor and his colleagues in DIT were along these lines in this slide. I mean, the first one was, it sounds a bit basic, but we, we really sort of did feel we had to say it. Like, we can't do everything. We can't focus on everything. And if you look at successful export strategies, inward investment strategies, as we've done, you know, from all around the world and from, you know, other countries and all, like focus is always a big part of them. And we've strongly recommended to DIT and colleagues that they focus on some version of those priority sectors that have come out of that sort of analysis that we've done. Uh, and we think that sort of focus will help, you know, with the overall impact. Secondly, there's something about long term in this and trust and long term relationships. I mean, I know from my world, you know, of trying to build relationships. I mean, even within the PwC Global Network, it takes time. You don't just rock up and have people in your pockets. It doesn't matter how glitzy your presentation is or whatever. It takes time. And that means that if we're serious about this as an opportunity, we need to afford ourselves the time to invest in relationships. And and I hope the IT colleagues didn't mind. We, we called out one of the things that we saw that others felt back to us that sometimes in the UK government, there was a wee bit of, like over, I would say, overly high turnover of staff, you know, in terms of some of the the positions either in the sort of headquarters team or in the local team. And we just sort of felt the need to call that out and try and encourage government to sort of build for the long term, you know, because a lot of this is about sort of individual per personal relationships. The third thing was about like B2B stuff. You know, as I've said, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of good intent. And, you know, we talked about the myths at the beginning and all, there was quite a lot of good intent and willing amongst UK business, but a lot of people just weren't quite sure where to start. And so in terms of, you know, like even basic information about Russia and about what the network organizations were and the industry organizations were and where the hubs of expertise were and all, I think there's definitely a role for government in terms of supporting UK businesses with some information that can support businesses do what they need to do, which is build the long-term business partnership relationships. And finally, there's something around finance. You know, given that a lot of exporters are from the SME sector, and as we've seen some of the sort of aspects of the, the market, the structures of the market seem to be going against SMEs in terms of raising capital and that sort of thing. There's, there, there seemed to us to be a clear rule for 
uh, certainly for DIT alongside other parts of government to support the development of finance solutions that can that can help SMEs. I mean, that's that's it. Uh, you know, I suppose if I stand back from it all, uh, I'd go back to I suppose the caveat that Oksana and I both said at the beginning. Look, we hope you forgive us if some of what we've come up with has been taken over by some of the very challenging events, but but we sort of feel the kernel of what's in there is hopefully still relevant. And as, as we said at the beginning, we hope that what we've gone through at a high level is enough for at least a sort of exploratory conversation and to open up some aspects of dialogue and exploration that, that could introduce some more UK businesses to the, the opportunities to export into Russia because having looked at the data and as I said, you know, personally coming from a sort of pretty agnostic sort of starting point on all of this uh, and probably ill-informed starting point for me personally, you know, the data does suggest that like it's a big place, it's a strong economy and some of these barriers that we've outlined, yeah, some of them are pretty hardcore structural regulatory things, but some of them are pretty basic, you know, things around information and building relationships. And, and we do think there's an opportunity to work alongside Trevor and his colleagues in, in the UK government to start to open up uh, new opportunities. And in the context of, you know, what we've all had to sort of suffer and, you know, the challenges that COVID has provided, but also with, from a UK perspective, you know, Brexit and redefining Britain's place in the world, I think it's incumbent on us all to explore the opportunities where they lie. And I would really encourage you to sort of keep the conversation going, if relevant with ourselves, but certainly with, with Trevor and his colleagues to look at that. And Trevor, I'm, I'm, I can see you on a small screen in the, t in the corner of my... Uh, uh, screen here. I hope that's okay. And I'm maybe am I handing back to either Ludmilla or Trevor or, or but I'm, I'm quite sure I'm going to stop talking there. You'll all be glad to hear. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I, I mean, I think Lud Ludmilla will come in, but I'm just happy to just to sort of, you know, come back on a couple of those points that you went through. So, and a couple of trends, if you like, that, that, that came through the presentation as well. And the one I think around um, relationships gets back to what I was saying at the very, very beginning about getting people to actually come and visit the market themselves. So this was particularly, again, I think it was aimed mainly at uh, SMEs, but it's not exclusive to SMEs because I'm sure it's true of the bigger companies. So, you know, we would hope that, uh, you know, one of the outcomes of, of this particular presentation today is that some companies who haven't been to Russia before might actually now consider it, you know, a good place to come and look. I'm not, you know, I'm not naive. I don't think you're suddenly going to get on a plane and come here and win huge amounts of business necessarily. You might do if you're very lucky. But if you do come out here and meet some of the Russian companies, speak to Russian companies, work with Russians and understand the market a bit better, you know, I'd be pretty, uh, I'd be pretty sort of confident that some companies will come here and will develop those relationships and the partnerships and, and win the business. I mean, it's very anecdotal, but the number of people in, in, in the couple of years I've been here, obviously it's slowed down due to COVID, but uh, who, you know, I've sort of speaking to who've come to Moscow or St. Petersburg on their very first visits are very, very impressed with the city. Even something as basic as that, the, the image of, of what they expected uh, is very different from what they find when they're here. So, so I hope that would certainly be a, a sort of factor in terms of getting people out here. The talent point, I think, is, is, is very, very relevant. Um, I think there is huge, huge amounts of talent in Russia, uh, but it's interesting that one of the trends was very much it's the, the, the technical expertise, if you like, but perhaps not so good on the soft skills. And this has come up uh, in some separate research that we did where, where people can perhaps do a bit more around the softer skills. And again, particularly because when I mentioned the national projects earlier on, one of the national projects or one of the areas that Russia's trying to develop is also for Russia to export because it tends to bring everything in at the moment. You know, it's got good skills and it wants to export. And if you're going to do that, you need not just talented technical people, you need people who are capable of going out and making, again, in the same way, relationships in other parts of the world. Uh, so that was uh, very good there. Uh, in terms of the focus and some of those um, points there, yeah, on, on, on the funding, uh, it is recognised and we are doing some work on that. 
so we have got uh, quite a large project which is out to tender at the moment uh, on green finance specifically that obviously ties in with our ambitions around uh, obviously as the sort of chair of, of COP26 uh, this year in Glasgow in November. Uh, so there's a big project there and it is quite a significant one, not all commercially driven, but you know some of it in terms of standards, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But I kind of think if you're improving the standards, you're opening up business opportunities for people who are in those areas as well. And it's worth, in fact, I think you may have asked a question, but uh, and it's worth also um, mentioning that we've got a chap called Russell now who's joined us. Well, he was with us anyway, but we've taken on a regional finance role for across ECAN, as we call it, which is Eastern Europe, which is effectively just Russia in our case uh, and Central Asia. Uh, and that's for regional out, uh, outlook, so not just doing Russia, but doing some of the other markets like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, so we've got more resource there. Um, the point around um, the length of posting and UK-based staff in particular coming and going, it's been an ongoing thing. Uh, I'm not sure it will change very much. Um, I think we're better than we used to be. So mm. a lot of what were just two-year posts, I'm sure a few years ago, Russia was potentially just a two-year posting with an option of a third. Now it's three years plus one. And a lot of the postings that were three years plus one are now four years plus one around the world to try and get people to stay on for, for five years um, in, in, in some markets or three or four years in somewhere like Russia. So it's not perfect. And there's also arguments arguments within, within our services that there's also benefits to the organisation more generally of people moving learning skills in one place and then moving them somewhere else. Uh, but I think we probably could go for you know more longevity uh, in terms of postings. Uh, I guess uh, from a personal point of view it's kind of yeah well what's in it for me and, and, and that sometimes people want to know you know what the sort of career benefits for them staying in one place uh, for longer are even if it's, it's a really nice place like Russia. So but it is something people are aware of. And then in terms of the finance, another one on the finance so look at the very last point uh, there is i mean and it's not you know it's not something we there's no reason why we shouldn't make more noise about it but there is a uk export finance offer for russia uh, so there is a facility available uh, so for companies who do have that concern and, and, and it's about the risk of payments uh, then you know I think uh, that's something that they, they could look at having said that and again this is very anecdotal but uh, I it's only two years since I've been here I have very few complaints here from companies about payments you know it's not something we, we can really do a huge amount anyway but you know I think just often out of frustration people will sometimes write to the trade team and say well look this company we've been working with they haven't paid us uh, and I think I can only think of one that I've had you know any involvement with in the time I've been in Russia uh, in previous postings China Dubai Malaysia it was a much more regular occurrence so that suggests to me uh, again it's anecdotal so I don't have any facts to back it up but it suggests to me that you know the payment thing isn't actually a problem although it may be and one of the slides I think alluded to the fact in some cases it was sort of 120 days before people got paid but seemingly you know after that extended period they do get paid so so those were just some of the things I just wanted to come back on and I think probably hand over to back to Luda now I think Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, David and Oksana, for such detailed and uh, fair presentations. And uh, at this point, I would like to encourage the audience to ask the questions uh, in the chat box. We have already some good questions, uh, actually, on insurance, finance, fintech, and architectural services. Uh, David, may kindly ask you to look at these. Meanwhile, I will just briefly introduce uh, all the audience to the services available to the UK companies and uh, let you know how we at DT Russia, how our team can support you. So that's only one slide from my side. Of course, to those completely new to market, we are happy to answer any questions you may have about Russia, about the market, about the ways to do business in your uh, specific sector or your area of interest. So please don't hesitate to contact us. I have now put the contact details for our team in the chat as well, for the ease of reference for you, and you can also see them on the slides. My colleague Anna and my Myself will be happy to take these in initial inquiries and please contact Russell if you are interest, interested in ECAN regional outreach and wider regional outreach. So uh, as Trevor mentioned in also his introduction, we are running a series of events to promote uh, the specific areas of UK expertise and we are trying to match the demand in Russia or with UK excellence and with UK proposition. So we are looking to run uh, about four uh, hybrid events, uh, both online and offline events, if uh, the pandemic situation permits, in specifically in uh, financial professional and legal services so uh, please stay in touch with us we'll let you uh, know more uh, in the future about those uh, the themes for those events and uh, the timing for those events 
So we do support large initiatives like uh, the English Law Week, uh, which is arranged by the Law Society of uh, England, Wales, and the Bar Council. Uh, also looking to expand this initiative and work with other regional associations uh, to help them uh, to promote uh, UK services uh, in the Russian market. And uh, for the UK companies, we can do a tailored partner search uh, in Russia if you would like to find uh, a local partner. And this is probably one of the most common routes to the Russian market. And uh, for those companies which are already established in Russia or have connections uh, with Russia, we do tailored events and activities to promote the company's services or uh, to uh, target the key clients of the company. Again, this can be arranged at the British Embassy or the ambassador's residence and do have a higher value uh, in terms of promoting your brand uh, and uh, reaching out to your key clients. And as I said, uh, we can now offer a regional outreach to the countries uh, in East Europe and Central Asia region, and there will be more activities coming up uh, in the year to, uh, to promote the UK to, uh, to the region. One of the questions which came during the preparation to this webinar uh, from uh, the companies who registered was how long does it take to set up in Russia? Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the answer will be quite average. It's about uh, two months, but um, you will need to consider uh, what is it, it would be exactly the best route for your company and your services specifically, because setting up uh, a local presence uh, can work or cannot work for, for you. For example, we do know that there are about 30 UK legal companies uh, who have set up their presence in Russia, and obviously for some legal companies, that's one of the uh, possible options. Other legal companies do provide their services to the Russian companies from overseas, from the UK, and are also successful in that. Uh, many companies, for example, in advertising or, or marketing consultancy uh, provide services uh, directly and it doesn't require to be set up uh, in Russia, it's just um, selling your services to a specific client directly. Sometimes it will be helpful to have a local partner and work with your local partner. So uh, again, we will be happy to advise uh, on the best route to market. Uh, so that's basically it for me. Just remind, please note our email addresses and don't hesitate to contact us. And now uh, I will uh, get back to uh, the questions uh, which are in the chat box. So the first one was uh, on reinsurance and what is the outlook of Russia and what more could the UK reinsurance do to compete with the likes of Germany and Switzerland uh, in Russia? So probably David uh, or your colleagues, could you take up this question? Uh, I mean, as I'm sort of slightly nervous about answering because most of the research that we did was you know a, a little bit uh of time ago but i mean we definitely based on the quantitative work we identified i mean we talked i talked about financial services but like insurance and reinsurance was the bit of financial services that we uh that we covered in that and so we definitely landed on that as an opportunity area and I suppose the issue for us, and it was certainly at the time of doing the research, we had stuff around the Russian, Russian National Reinsurance Company and some of the sort of structural aspects of the market that just seemed to be putting off some of the UK companies who, who were considering this. Now, Trevor, you may want to add into this because uh, you maybe have a, a more sort of recent sense of it than, than me, but but it was definitely something where it was a good area for the UK in terms of the UK platform, but there were some aspects of the market that were definitely going against. So maybe, Trevor, do you mind if I ask you? No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, I need to look at the percentage. I thought a pretty large chunk of the reinsurance market does already go to the UK. 
but but it's clearly one that's that sort of you know we we should zoom in on a bit more and, and and part of my thinking there is is we'll need to put on you know some events and bring out some of the sort of UK reinsurers I don't know working with Lloyd's of London or whoever and actually bring them out and actually do some seminars and try and find out a where the opportunities are uh, and b what the demand is like and, and and if if we do something like that and it turns out to be you know too difficult or or, or sort of awkward or the business just isn't there at least we'll know but I think it's definitely an area that we'll need to sort of you know look into in a bit more detail I wouldn't say any more than that because I think we obviously need a bit more background but but but, but my sense was quite a lot of business does go to the UK but it may also be that because of that we've sat on our laurels slightly there uh, and just said well we're getting all this business and now you know over time some of it's starting to you know Russell mentions Germany and Switzerland there that we might be missing out on that and so what we need to do is sort of reinvigorate our own efforts on that so so, so I'll take that away as an action yeah I think that's that, that's right Trevor and like Ludmilla you you can kindly went through on your slide there some of the the services that you and your colleagues are providing and you talked about you know events and bespoke partner searches and and tying into some of the existing events and platforms that are around i mean it's a very competitive world at the moment you know and it's a very competitive landscape in relation to exports and inward investment so so i think you know insurance and reinsurance is a really good area to sort of have some of those actions tailored actions you know that support uk companies uh looking at that Well, thank you, Trevor and David, for your answers. So we'll move on to the next questions, uh, which is uh, on finance and uh, pure fintech uh, focus on technology needs. And is there an option for UK companies to sell fintech technologies? Uh, I think also, as Trevor mentioned during the presentation, the market here is very competitive uh, and very advanced in terms of mm -hmm. domestic uh, fintech uh, technologies and about uh, the way uh, Russian banks operate. Uh, many of them are already uh, digital and very advanced uh, in fintech. Having said that, uh, there are options in very specific and very tailored services not yet available uh, in Russia. And we are trying to explore those uh, at our conference back uh, in November uh, with UK companies and to see where uh, the UK proposition is and what exactly we can offer it to the market. Uh, probably it's not a pure fintech, but uh, um, technologies around uh, well, round fintech, round the services and uh, those technologies which would help to improve the experience. Uh, again, those linked to the insurance, those technologies linked to the new services and uh, anything which could expand uh, the offer of the banks and help them step actually into the new areas, not purely uh, banking and not purely uh, fintech. So hopefully that answers the questions and we'll continue work uh, on uh, fintech uh, in this year. Hopefully again, we'll have an activity uh, in the autumn to help UK companies promote their their offer to, uh, to the Russian companies. And just to add into that, Ludmilla, I think that, that's, that's a great answer, but just to add into it, I mean, remember that one of the key things that we got from all of this is about the excellent brand uh, that the UK has in relation to financial services generally. And, you know, to the extent that fintech is sort of part of that, I think, you know, we mustn't lose that sort of very strong platform that the UK has as part of the sort of sales engine, if you like, uh, in relation to fintech. And also, you know, Trevor mentioned was Alpha or Tinkoff or whatever, you know, there are clear signs of hope. I mean, it is a competitive market in Russia, but there are clear signs of some very good things happening. So, yep. Yeah, I would add on there. I think as those as those particular banks start to expand, and and, and they are very good and, and very sort of you know technologically advanced. But I guess what that does mean is they expand and, and and sort of you know offer more and more services. What it will offer, I think, as as far as fintech is concerned, are some of the niche opportunities. So where we've got UK companies with niche skills to operate that they haven't actually already uh, developed themselves, and that might be where the opportunities are. So it's not going to be a huge landscape on there. But I think there is specific areas where companies can can, can do quite nicely work working with already well-established Russian partners. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you, Devin Trevor. Next question is about architectural services as a sector, and one of uh, the attendees to the webinar mentioned that uh, their company undertook some uh, work in Russia but found the market quite difficult uh, since 2017. And the question was about the current state of development uh, of the market. Uh, so, um, I would appreciate any comments from maybe David uh, on the developments of architectural services. And uh, I can also add to that later on. Look, I, I'm going to apologize on that one and pass on that because honestly, it was not a sector that came out strongly from the research when we did it. Now, I'm sure it's it's a great opportunity too, but, but just in terms of the research that we did, I can't really comment on it because we didn't have that much. But I mean, other colleagues may, may want to chip in. Uh, no problem, probably the, uh, then I will take uh, these. So, Lila, can, I, can I briefly yes, add sure. maybe on this one? Um, it's just a brief overview of the market. You're correct that three or four years ago it might have been difficult to uh, be here because the uh, market has been very active uh, early 2000s mm -hmm. and 2010. And uh, it was kind of a boost of the architectural services and projects whatsoever. However, there might be, uh, and it has been already, you know, kind of full. The market really is, uh, uh, has reached maybe it's uh, a bit of its potential. However, uh, there are still a lot of infrastructural projects going on in uh, regions. So if we take not, not St. Petersburg and not Moscow, uh, then there is still a vast and huge potential in regional development and smaller cities which are restructuring their uh, city services and the life quality in cities and the demand is huge there and uh, maybe this is the uh, these are the projects you might be interested to look into depending on what kind of architectural services you provide for what kind of projects. Thank you. Over to you, Luda. Uh, thank you, Oksana, for this comment. Uh, I was actually going to make this, uh, almost the same remark that the market uh, of architectural services is quite active at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of renovation going on uh, as well as new construction uh, going on and also with substantial focus uh, on green technologies of, uh, and smart cities which become more and more popular in Russia and are high on the agenda of the government. So uh, if uh, this is these are the angles you're working in. It's worth considering, and uh, as I can say, lots of regional projects, lots of development projects. Uh, architectural services uh, sector is not an easy one uh, because uh, lots of tendering process uh, is involved into that. Uh, but again, it's the one which is open, uh, and usually the common route to market would be via the partnership uh, with local uh, companies, local architectural services, and then going to the tenders together with a local partner. And that's one of the options to win the business here. Actually, sometimes Russian companies are proactively uh, looking for architectural services to be provided from the UK. And for example, just from one of the recent researches I did uh, is that architectural services for one of the large entertaining centers in Russia was provided by the UK companies and this one, uh, a Russian company was looking specifically for UK uh, service providers. So the opportunities are there uh, and we will be happy to explore them in more detail. Uh, if you refer to us, please don't hesitate to contact us uh, on that. Uh, one other question which also uh, came from the chat uh, is um, from a company which uh, provides support to the Russian companies who are setting up uh, uh, in the UK or in other companies. Uh, just to answer that, we have um, a dedicated colleague uh, at Deity Russia who is working to help Russian companies to set up their business presence uh, in the UK. And uh, she's quite proactive in encouraging uh, the investment in the UK and setting up uh, the Russian businesses uh, in the UK. So hopefully we can cooperate with, uh, on that. Uh, uh, we've the service providers and the legal companies and consultancy companies which would help uh, Russian companies to set up in the UK and thus uh, the UK uh, benefit and business uh, environment would benefit from uh, more and more businesses expanding to the UK and bringing in new uh, workplaces, new companies and uh, new business activities to the market. So happy to cooperate on that and happy to uh, take it forward with you. Uh, 
in our email conversation as subsequent talks. So, what else do we have in the chat? Uh, so there was a question on steel production and uh, steel manufacturing. So again, uh, we have dedicated colleagues who work uh, on advanced engineering here. Happy to link uh, you with them and uh, explore specific opportunities in the sectors because all well, these questions are very sector specific. Uh, again, we are happy to look uh, into any specific inquiries you may have, but that would uh, require us to look uh, at your inquiry in more detail and probably do some background research and refer you to the colleagues who are responsible for specific sectors. On, on, on David's point at the bottom, uh, Luda, uh, concerning sort of, you know, the work he's done in Moscow, I think that probably fits very, very neatly with um, what we were saying earlier on about most of the opportunities or the potential for growth being outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. But having said that, where somebody I think can show a very good track record of projects that they've de delivered, you know, to high quality in Moscow, then I think that will be of interest to, to, to some, of the, some of the regional cities. That's where I think the real opportunities are. It's quite clear for me, I don't have not sort of due to COVID traveled around Russia quite as much as I would have liked, but these are significant cities in their own right, you know, one, two million people, uh, all of whom, you know, have got quite strong ambitions, I think, to develop themselves and grow themselves. So things like science, Science park, business parks are exactly the type of thing that they're, they're thinking of, uh, a lot of it under the sort of the smart cities banner. So that's certainly something that we, we, we could help David with if he wants to get in touch with us offline and, and, and we'll take that forward separately. Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, I think we can wrap up. So thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers today. Uh, thank you to David and his team for a very fair presentation. Trevor, also thank you for introduction and support to today's webinar. And thank you to the audience um, for you to stay with us until the end. And uh, once again, I would encourage you to contact our team uh, via our email and we'll be happy to take forward any issues you may have with regards to the Russian market and offer you our support. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you bye okay take care bye now thank you bye